It's been a good day living for you. It's been a good day talking about you. I got to spend most of the day driving across the fair state of Arkansas towards the unfair state of Louisiana and back and uh, with my son and uh, got to do a lot of preaching to him. I needed the practice and he needed the preaching. So, so uh, uh, we just been having church for about eight hours, the last eight hours, and I just got here. So, um, how many of you love the Lord? How many of you love your mama? You really love your mama? I want you to raise your hands. I love my mama. If you don't, we really need to talk. But I don't even have a text for tonight, and I. I just want to talk to you about some Bible, kind of a crash course in Bible stories. By the way, we had 18, 12, and 13-year-olds in class last Wednesday night. Isn't that amazing? Um, the uh, I, I love my mama, and I love my dad, and I, I, I love you. But I don't like it when my mama tells me I'm wrong. I love her. She's the best mama in the world. But if mom comes to me and says, hey, bud, I I need to tell you something, instantly, and you're the same way, your hackles go up. Bless God, I'm not wrong. You're just old-fashioned. Bless God, bless God. It doesn't matter how much we love somebody. I said mama because you love your mama. It doesn't matter how much we love somebody. When somebody comes to you and they start to tell you what to do or what not to do, it's human nature to go, right? So how many of you love God? (laughs) But you still don't like it when God tells you what to do. No matter how much you love him, no matter how much he's done for you, Nobody likes it when they read those scriptures that say, don't. Is that all right? So let's talk about it for just a minute. God bless you. You may be seated. If you get sleepy, you can just stand up. There's a fellow that was just chronically sick. He just had everything wrong with him. You've met those people. You see them in Walmart and you don't dare ask how they're doing. Because you're going to be there for a while. And you just be like, hey man, how you doing? Bless y'all. <laughs> and, uh, but this fellow was, he just, everything was wrong with him. He had you know, pain all over and discomfort all over and food didn't taste good. And he uh, took a big old handful of pills every day and it didn't seem to fix the problem. And so he went to the doctor and, 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 and went to the next doctor and went to the next doctor and no doctor would fix him. And, but he heard about this specialist that was the greatest at diagnosing the problem. He, this doctor was a professional at telling folks, really getting to the root of the problem, and that, man, I can't wait to talk to this doctor and uh, and find out the cure to what's wrong with me. So he went to this doctor, and they poked him and prodded him and sent him through a whole bunch of tests, and and uh, then he came back in a few days for his diagnosis. He sat down with the doctor, and the doctor looked at him, sir, and he said, I, I know how to fix what's wrong with you. And he was so excited. And this is what the doctor told him. He said, quit smoking, lose 50 pounds, walk one mile a day, eat more dark green vegetables, and throw all your pills away. He didn't like that very much. Nobody. I was in the hospital, actually sitting in the, in the room with the, the family consultation room with a family. And a man that, that uh, I know very well was, was having heart trouble. And the doctor was talking to him about his heart trouble. And he hadn't done what the doctor told him to do. And if you know Dr. Ben, he'll just tell you straight. 
And I was sitting in there, and, and, and I'm not a bit, I mean, Dr. Ben's a great doctor. I'm not sure that he's the most likable guy in the world. But I was sitting there with him, and uh, he said, uh, he was talking to this man, and he, the more he talked, the angrier he got, and he just started telling him, you know, you're going to die if you don't do what I tell you to do. You're just going to die. You want me to, you want to get, go do what you want to do and me come in here and fix you and said, I can't fix you anymore. You got to fix yourself. And he just tore him up pretty good. His wife was sitting over there and he said, honey, you could stand to lose 50 pounds yourself. And nobody liked that. And it got real quiet in there, but it was good advice. The deal is no matter how much you love somebody, you really don't want anybody telling you what to do. Uh, people just don't like that. A young lady, she had a gambling problem. She would borrow money from work and then she'd sneak it back to feed her habit. She got caught. She got fired. She started drinking, started worrying. Had a hit and run, two DWIs. She found out about this great defense lawyer that could get her out of jail, that could help her. And so she went and met with him. They met for two hours. Meeting went real well. He asked her all the right questions. She was excited, man. This guy's smart. He understands me. He's going to help me. And she said, well, okay, how's it going to be, sir? And he said, well, you're going to do some, you're going to get some jail time. You're going to do some community service and you need to get an extra job until the trial so you can pay me my fee so I'll defend you in court <laughs> people don't like that and so you can pay back some of the money you stole people don't like that let's take this all the way back to creation here's Adam and Eve I'm talking about perfect it's a perfect world and they perfectly fit and they're perfect Eve in my opinion was the most beautiful woman that ever lived they're just perfect physically their world is perfect they fit perfectly into a perfect world they had a perfect life it can't get any better than living in the garden of Eden perfect sorry so it's good for not changing your battery uh so they, they had this perfect environment, and they were perfect people, and they were never sick, and they were never going to die. The mathematical precision with which the, the, the universe had been created and the earth had been created and the human body had been created, the mathematical precision of all that was, was incomprehensible, impossible to comprehend. And this, they were living in this utopia. God didn't tell them anything I mean, they didn't have a long list. I mean, they didn't. If we tried to fit all the laws that apply just in Sling County, Arkansas, to you and I, might not the books might not fit in this room. All the laws written on the original Ten Commandments or the original Bill of Rights or the original Constitution of the United States of America, those laws wouldn't fit in this room. But Adam and Eve had one rule, and but people just hate being told no. And their rule was just: you can eat anything, just don't eat that. And you know what? Every time they passed that tree, their mouth just watered. Because somebody told them they couldn't. God's been good. They walked with him in the cool of the day. They loved God. They just hated the fact that they told them they couldn't. What I'm trying to tell you, it's just human nature. You're not, you're just normal if you don't like people telling you what to do. I, I love my sons. I, I, I love Jade. Jade is the happiest person in the world until you start telling her what to do, and she gets this look on her face. She looks like a lightning thunderstorm. She's a sweet girl. I can talk to Jordan and start giving him advice that's against what he thinks, and he gets real quiet on the phone. Or in person. You know what I'm talking about, don't you, Kevin? Yeah. People just don't like that. When I get a call from my dad and he said, hey, son, i got to talk to you, I'm like, oh, no. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, nobody likes that. People don't like to be told what to do. They want freedom. 
don't eat that one fruit. Well, that you got me in jail because I can't eat that one fruit. How stupid does that sound? But it's exactly what caused them to fall. How stupid is that? We look back and say, dude, you had it figured out. Just don't. But we can't help it. We've always heard about the forbidden fruit. People don't like to be told no. They want freedom. Years ago, and when I pastored in Texas, I had a young woman walk into my church, and she, she walked into our, she taught Sunday school. They were very involved in our church, her and her husband. And she said, you know what, just, I got married when I was 18, and I've never known what it's like to have freedom. I just want to be free. And that lady's life is a complete disaster today. At the moment, that's what Eve did. She said, I, I want freedom. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I want freedom. I'm going to do what I want to do. Do you think Eve ever regretted that moment for the rest of her life? Let's talk about it in the Old Testament. By the way, at the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, and at the same moment that you and I went against God's rule, we became, Adam and Eve became, and you're not going to like anything I'm going to say, and I know it before I say it. We became useless, hopeless, helpless until Jesus justified us and them with his own blood. Adam was worthless, Eve was worthless until Jesus died on Calvary. Until that blood started pouring out of the stripes on his back and all of a sudden they became justified. What I'm telling you is thank God for the blood, huh? Cain, how many of you remember the story of Cain? Cain was Adam and Eve's firstborn son. A chip off the old block. He brought his sacrifice. You remember the story. And God said, Cain, that won't work. Go and do better. Cain said, no, I'll kill my brother because no one's going to tell me they don't like my stuff. And he became a murderer. He came, became angry with his brother. What did his brother do? He wasn't really angry with his brother. He was angry with God, and he took it out on his brother. His anger at God and his jealousy towards his brother caused murder. Because people just don't like to be told what to do. People don't like to be told what they did was wrong. And so when you're a pastor, you spend your whole life just tippy-toeing and walking the high wire, trying your best to nudge people in the right direction because we don't have a bully pulpit we don't have the authority of the right to say bless God you do this or you're going to go to hell we really don't have that biblical right I don't care how many times you read the Bible you don't find that happening but it's a fact that sometimes there's rules and people just don't like rules we're driving home today I said, Jordan, what's the speed limit? He said, well, I think it's 55. I said, well, good, I'll drive 64. Because <laughs> I don't like a 55-mile-hour speed limit. It's like, how crazy is that? Because I think I can drive 64 and a popo won't pull me over. I'm still breaking the law. I just don't like it. It's my car. I paid for the road my gas well bless God I can do what I want to and I don't I'm not the least bit concerned about other people's feelings or concerns the reason there are rules is because what Eve did affected the whole world to this day what happens to you and what you do you don't live in a vacuum when you make a mistake that ripple just goes on and on, generation to generation, church member to church member, 
business associate to business associate, we must be careful that we listen to the voice of God. Why did they build the Tower of Babel? Because God told them not to. Basically. Children of Israel, they murmured when they were in Egypt. They complained about making bricks. What happened when they left Egypt and they were in the wilderness? Same stuff. What happened when they got to the promised land? Same stuff. Herod loved John's preaching until John told him some things he shouldn't be doing. You shouldn't have your daughter, your stepdaughter dance like that in front of you. You shouldn't do that. Okay, John, I'll cut your head off. I like your preaching. I like your vocabulary. I like your jokes. Just don't tell me what to do. I'm the king. Uh Uh-oh. May have struck a chord there. I like the worship. I like the music. I even kind of like the preacher, but just don't tell me because who do you think? I'm nobody and nothing. But we do have the Word of God, and the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharp. So, amen. The Gadarenes were upset. People didn't like Stephen. Because he was telling them about their sin. Paul had him stoned. The Gadarenes were upset because their pigs died. Paul was beheaded because he told the Roman government that there was a greater king than Caesar. People just don't like to be told stuff. And so I said all that to say this. You came to church because you were hungry. You came to church because you wanted to know. Because at least part of you was not satisfied with the answers that you had. And over the next few weeks, on Wednesday night and on Sundays, we're going to try our best to give you some good old Acts 238 answers. And I'm asking you, don't shoot the messenger. Because there's going to be some of it that every one of us in here, including myself, wishes wasn't in there. But it's in there. And so why don't we preach it and let the rough end drag? And if it's the word of God, I have... Paul came into... Jesus came into the most traditionally religious society in the history of the planet. And he just turned it upside down. Well, my traditions are right. Well, the person sitting across from you thinks their traditions are right too. It doesn't matter if I think I'm right, if I'm not right. How about those mamas that train their little 14-year-old boys to strap bombs on their back and walk into malls? Are they right? But they think they are. So let's not be so arrogant to think that we know everything. And let's go, how many of you really believe the Word of God is true? And so what we have to do is as, as a minister of the gospel, we have to present the word of God in a way that is irrefutable and easily understood. So if I start using words that are too big or concepts that are too complicated or theological doctrines that were written in the third century that nobody understands, I hadn't done anybody any good. But if we can t- stay with the simple gospel and I can say this is what it says. Like I said Sunday morning, all means all. Everybody means everybody. It's real simple to understand if we just read it, ask the questions, and explain it. The Bible is not complicated. There shouldn't be 50 different denominations. There should only be one church, a blood-bought, Bible-believing church. How come there's so many different? Because somebody didn't like something they heard, so they did it a different way. And you got all these different things going, all these different... Martin Luther never intended for his followers to stop after his death and just build a church and never progress. He wanted to take the church all the way back to the first century. So what was his goal? But people just stop with their level of revelation. 
And I'm not against Lutheranism. I've got some great, I'm not against any of that. I, ever, I, I, I love people that love God. I'm just saying there's got to be a truth. And it's got to be simple and it's got to be in the gospel. And I believe that. That doesn't mean we have to agree on everything, but we all ought to agree we shouldn't eat to that tree because that's a bad deal. And so there's some things that absolutely must be avoided. And if there are those things, then I want my preacher to tell me. And when he tells me, I'm not going to get mad at him for telling me. Because I'm going to humbly tell you. Because if I arrogantly tell you, I'll fall into that trap I set for you. Just like Haman hung from his own gallows that were built for Mordecai in the book of Esther. So we've got to be careful with how we present the gospel. You can present the truth in such an ugly passage, uh, package that everybody runs from it, and all of you know what I'm talking about. The truth is not ugly. It's beautiful. It'll set you free. It's the greatest thing in the history of the world, and everybody needs it. Went to the Zig Ziglar course one time when I was a, just a young man working for a corporation, and and Mr. Ziegler told the story about a boy that he just got out of college and he, he went to work for a shoe company selling shoes. Sent this boy to a, an island in the Pacific. And he sent a telegram back to, to his company. He said, you know, nobody here wears shoes. What am I doing here? Y'all come get me. And so they, he left on the next ship. But the company was determined, and so they, the next young man that they hired, they, they sent him over to that island to see if he could do any better. And He sent a telegram back, and he said, Oh, my goodness, please send more shoes. Nobody has them. It's all about how you look at it. Everybody needs them. Nobody has them. And the gospel, we need the gospel. And we get negative-minded about the gospel, then we will lose our relationship, and we've got to be careful. I want to be positive about the gospel. And in order to be positive about the gospel, we must present it positively. This will help you. This will set you free. Not if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell. That's not the right approach, folks. True or not, it's not the right approach. The problem is, if you tell people that, you might be there with them because your attitude and your presentation is worse than their sin. If you present the gospel, the Bible talks about pastors that scatter the sheep. I don't want to be one of those. And you shouldn't be in the place that you work and the family that you, you should be someone that gathers and loves and nurtures and cares instead of someone that scatters and pushes and yells and screams and shouts orders. That just doesn't work. So when we talk about repentance and that dying and what we have to do when we repent, when we talk about baptism, when we talk about the doctrines of salvation. When you talk about those things, I'm just asking you to come. And if this little group of people here tonight, we, we had a big old crowd Sunday morning, and we're going to have a big old crowd this next Sunday morning and a lot bigger crowd than that the next Sunday. And it's just we've had seven first-time families in two weeks. It's awesome. We had a family I didn't even know about sitting on the back row back there. I didn't even know it till after church. And... uh we, we, we got this opportunity, but if this little group of people, when pastor stands up here, whoever's preaching, says something that's, that's in the word of God, even though it may be a little bitter, it's sweet to the soul. Somebody say, say amen. Somebody get behind him. And let's create a positive momentum, a positive atmosphere where people can change. Because I don't know if you get this or not, but the status quo ain't working. The world's in a mess. The world needs a church that will preach the truth in love and that the people of God will stand there and say, hey, I'm so glad to be a part. Look what God's done for me since that happened to me, since God touched me, since God's filled me, since God saved me, since I repented, since I, all wonderful testimonies. And we're going to have some of those on Easter. When you show someone 
in the Bible irrefutably. And there are irrefutable. Anybody know what that means? I think it means absolutely true. You can't prove them to be wrong. Doctrines. When you show somebody stuff in the Bible that is absolutely proven in the Scripture, and this is a, a, a silly question, but it, do, does it matter what that person believed before? Doesn't matter. Truth still truth. Does it matter what I believed before? No. Truth is still truth. I preached a sermon. I was 28 years old, and I'll never forget. I preached like the house was on fire, and I was the smartest guy in the building. And I went and sat in my office, and I was sitting there with my chest all puffed out, and we had about 25 people. That was a record attendance. And uh, Glenn Caldwell walks into my office, and he sits down with me. He said, you're my best friend, and I love you. Well, I said, thank you, Glenn. But what you just preached was dead wrong. Who do you think you are? I won you. I won you to the Lord way back when. I was there. I saw you get back. I gave you a home Bible study. Don't be telling me I'm wrong. I didn't say that, but that's exactly what I thought. And he opened the Scripture. And he patiently walked me through the Scripture. And he did it in such a kind way that when he got through, I was crying. And the next Sunday morning, I stood up and I apologized for what I had said. And I said, now Glenn's going to come up here and tell us how it really is. That's a hard thing to do. But the truth's the truth. And I learned right then, don't you preach something you think you know. Don't you say, if you, and that's where Whitley chapter 1 came from. I think I know a lot of stuff, but if I can't absolutely 100% prove it, I'll tell you this is my opinion. My opinion may or may not help you, but the Word of God will set you free. And so we we got to be careful, but we're going to have some awesome opportunity in the next few weeks. And my people are pouring in the building. They're pouring in here on Sundays. We're going to have awesome opportunities. And what we're going to do is we're going to patiently and carefully try to show them a way that their lives can be changed. Not just get them to come. This is not a social club, folks. This is a church. This is a soul-saving station. This is a place where people's lives can be changed. And people's lives were changed around this altar Sunday morning. From one corner to the other, people's lives were changed forever. And we got to make sure that happens a lot. And you know what I like about Sunday? No one's trying to draw attention to themselves. No one's flopping around in the floor like a fish out of water. No one was trying to make a scene. Everybody was just worshiping and being filled and being touched. And it was beautiful and it was real. And people loved it. That's a church that's seeker-friendly. It's a church that preaches the truth and lets people find God in their own way. And that's so beautiful. Am I making any sense to anybody but me? This is just how I think about ministry. So, but when you show somebody irrefutably, irrefutably in the Bible, they have an option. They will either scoff and walk away like the rich young ruler. He went away sorrowful. Or they will obey. And there's some people we can't do anything about. But a whole lot of that has to do with our attitude and our presentation. I went to a church uh, a long time ago. They didn't. They, 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 they thought if a, a man had a beard that he'd go to hell. You couldn't have a beard. Travis, bless your heart. So I'm going to pray for you. The... Uh, uh, and I remember there was a man that came into the church and uh, he, he had a beard and I thought, well, oh no, he's in for it. And and so when, the, when it came time for the minister to preach, he got up there and just lamb blasted this guy for an hour. And my heart went out to him and I felt so sorry for him and I caught him on the steps. I was just a, I was 21 years old and I was new and I God had just really touched me for the first time since I was 13 years old and I was on fire and I was teaching Bible studies and my heart went out to this guy and I tried to catch him on the steps and I said and I didn't know what to say I didn't, I didn't want to buck my pastor I, I just I, I love you I want you to come back he said why in the world would I ever set foot in this place again I wouldn't have stayed for the whole sermon I'd have left in the middle of it 
even if it would have been truth, and it wasn't truth, but even if it would have been truth, the way it was presented was so harsh that nobody that wasn't just part of the minion of the church would, would, would stay for that. We have to be careful with that. Because the truth will set you free. But if the truth is presented in an ugly vessel, you'll run somebody off and they'll never step foot and they need it so bad. We've got a world that needs God and needs the gospel so bad. And we've got to make sure we present it just right. We've got to stress out about it. Man, I don't want to. <clears throat> Trish Barnett, she's up with the children. She called me last Thursday or Friday. She said, Pastor, I need some advice. She's, I've been talking and the lady she was talking to is in here tonight. She said, I've been talking, and I just need some advice. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I want to, her. I want to love her. I said, thank you so much for calling. Because it's important how we speak to people about the gospel. And Mark, you know, if somebody asks you, if I'm going to hell, if I do this or I don't do that, and you answer that based on your tradition and not on some fact that you can easily prove in the Word of God, you might be the one going to hell. So we need to know what we're talking about, don't we? And so what I'm going to do in the next few weeks is try to make sure we know. The Bible says we ought to be able to be able to give an account of what we believe. We ought to be instantly be able to give an account of what we believe. And so, and not just what we believe, but what the Bible says and what the truth is. And so, uh, you just never know who you're talking to. Sometimes there were the boy that his brother and him were trapped in a school bus, and he knew that if his brother in, in, a, in a blizzard. And his father had told him that if if you ever get trapped, there was way, I believe it was in Minnesota, and if you ever get trapped in the ice or in the storm, in the blizzard, that if you fall asleep, you're dead. Because you get so cold, you fall asleep. And so all the other kids in the bus fell asleep, and every one of them was dead. He refused to fall asleep, and his little brother started falling asleep, and he just slapped him and slapped him and slapped him and slapped him and slapped him, shook him and beat him. Keep whatever I got to do. I got to keep him awake until the axe came through the roof of that bus and delivered. And those were only two boys that survived. Now, if you would, didn't know the story behind that, you say he was abusing his little brother. No, he was saving him. I'm sure his brother was thankful. And so sometimes we think things are rough, but what they're really doing is saving us. So we got to be careful not to shoot the messenger, especially if we think the messenger loves us and has our best interests at heart. So we're going to do some praying about it and uh, get into the Word of God. Is that all right? All right, I didn't read a single scripture tonight, but I had to say that before we dig in because when we dig in, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to challenge you. Uh, I don't want you to go to a church where you got to check your brain in at the front door before you come. I want you to put your brain in gear. We're going to methodically go through the Scripture. This, here's where it started in the Old Testament. Here's where it's at in the New Testament. Here's what the New Testament believers believe. Has this changed since the first century, yes or no? Well, then should we be doing it like they do it? Should, should, and we're going to do that, and we're going to prove that, and we're going to back it up with Scripture. And I think you'll like what you hear, but I just want to make sure that when we start that on Sunday that you all help me preach because we've got a lot of folks in here that need to know an awful lot about the Scripture. We've got a lot of people that know more about the Razorbacks than the Bible. And isn't that a terrible testimony? I don't want to be one. I know a lot about the Razorbacks, so I need to know a lot about this. Hey Amen. Would you stand with me? And let me say this, and I, I think this, and I, I really believe this, I think our worship our praise team, our musicians are as good as you can find. We've got a beautiful sanctuary. We've got beautiful technology. We've been very blessed. But unless we got the truth of the Word of God, that stuff doesn't. 
There's a lot of folks singing songs to Allah. Pretty songs. We've got to get the word in our heart. David said, I want to hide it in my heart because if I don't hide it, what he's trying to say, if I hide it in my heart, I won't sin. If I don't hide it, I will. So I want to hide my, the, your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And we all got to get a hunger for the word. We're all, we all love pretty music and we love we'll sing another one. Let's worship some more. We got to have the word. And really what I should have done Sunday is I should have stood up. We had wonderful worship, but I should have stood up and got in the word because we need the word. So we got to be lovers of the word. We got to be, got to be, got to be. Can I, did I say anything? Can I get a witness here down some base? And I, I want to be a Christian. In order to be a Christian, I got to understand God. In order to understand God, I got to read his word. And the Bible also says, and I'll read, I'll read this on Sunday, that we can't be saved without a preacher. We got to have a preacher. And you'll admit when you come to church, I read that scripture 20 times. And it just came, it, it just now makes sense. It's not because I'm the preacher. It's just because God chose the foolishness of preaching to save those that believe. And so you'd be sitting there, wow. Man, that's the first time that ever made sense. So that's why we, we come and we hear. And, but you've got to be a, a doer and a hearer and a reader and a studier of the word. And that's, that's what we want to do. So thank you for coming. We're going to talk about, and I'm open for topics too. I heard so much misinformation today on a conference call or on a call I got about end time and about the rapture. And and I, the way I knew it was misinformation, well, that doctrine has been taught since the 1830s, but here's the scripture. Here's the scripture. It doesn't matter how, how long it's been taught. It matters if it lines up with the scripture or not. So if you have a subject, I, I, I'm going to do a study on the rapture. There's so much misinformation out there about that. We need to understand that uh, because if you don't understand that and it don't work out the way that you've been taught and then God doesn't come when you think God ought to come, then there's going to be a lot of people disappointed in God. And it's not God that should be disappointed in. They just don't have a working knowledge of the Scripture. Any of those subjects like that, you can send me a note or, or talk to me or, or, or write a note and give it to Regina. And what we'll do is we'll spend some time in the Word, what does the Word say about this? Not what I believe or you believe. What does the Word say about this? And we'll bring some of that stuff out over the next few weeks. And I think it'll be very, very interesting. We won't be boring. And uh, we'll keep it as light as we can and still be able to drive home the fact that, that we all need the truth of the gospel. So I want more of God, not less. How about you? The more of the world you get, uh, the longer we live in this world, the more God we need. And so let's, let's, let's reach out for that. I'm going to get many more of you involved in ministry. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm so impressed with, with the whites and how they just locked in here. Uh, uh, I'm so impressed with the Beaumonts, how they just locked in here. I'm, I'm so impressed with, with some of our new folks just locked in, and they just gotta, we got to look for opportunities to get these folks with a, a, a fresh zeal more and more involved in, in ministry and outreach and church and and nobody is unqualified this thing where you got to go to church here so long and you got to do so no 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 everybody that loves it needs to be involved in it and uh, so we're going to do those things to get people more and more involved in what god's trying to do and just take it to the the more people it's been proven the fast growing churches have a higher percentage of their membership involved in ministry than those that don't grow the more people we get involved, they get excited. They bring folks. So that's exciting. I'm glad to be in church with you tonight. I'm sorry to bore you. I hope I didn't bore you. I just got to get this point across first. I don't want to be an Adam and an Eve. I don't want to be put off. I've got to prepare my mind. God, if you've got something for me, help me to, because it's human nature to push away and say no. But help me to prepare my mind. If my husband's right, or if my wife's right, well, I hit a nerve there, didn't I? If my boss is right, I should have started with husband and just left it there. But, but uh, help me to have the right attitude to receive it. And that's got to start with me. That's got to start with me. I have precious traditions. I have the greatest grandmother anyone could ever have. I have great 
great parents that weren't, uh, that were fair. They weren't, uh, they were very spiritual and very religious, but they were fair to their children. They didn't put us in strange boxes. They let us be kids, and but they taught us to love God. I have that wonderful tradition. I'm thankful for that tradition. Many of you could testify the same thing. And I, I, I just want to, but I need more of the truth of the gospel in my heart than I've ever had before. And I'm going to strive for that because I want to make it. I want to make it. I was talking to somebody yesterday and said, you know, we got to make it to heaven. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Who says what and does what? I just got to make it to heaven. And when something happens that challenges my attitude or my spirit, you know what that is? That's an attack of the enemy to get me out of heaven. So let's make it. Anybody want to make it to heaven? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, as we open your word, somehow we have to break the chains of history and we have to open our heart. We we can't be closed-minded or, or closed-hearted to what you're trying to say to us and to the church. We pray that you'd anoint our eyes, our ears, our mind, our heart with a salve of the gospel that would help us to comprehend and understand and not reject because of uh, the human nature the, and not get angry or upset because you're speaking to us of the truth of the gospel. Uh, just help us, God. We prepare our hearts. We break up the fallow ground in our heart so that the good seed of the gospel of Jesus Christ would take root in our heart and bring forth a fruit of righteousness that would, would show the world that you're still in the world and that you still love people and that you're still saving people and you're still delivering people and you're still healing people and you still love us. And we want to be that your feet and your hands and your voice. We want to be that oracle in this world. We want to be, we want to stand in the hedge and make up the gap. We want to be your apostle in this great end time revival that we know is right around the corner. In order for us to do that, we've got to have our heart right and our mind right. We may not be 100% right about everything, but we want to open our heart to your truth and we want to receive it when it comes. And we pray that you would help us to do that. Help me, Lord, as a preacher and as someone that, that talks about the Word, to present it in such an appetizing, like apples of gold and pictures of silver. And in order our lips to speak, our mouth to speak the things, our heart, Lord, to, to speak the things that you'd like for us to speak. And bind us together strongly with love that no one can break. And everybody said, in Jesus' name. Help us, God, in Jesus' name. God bless you tonight. Sorry for the rant, but I just we got to get there. We'll see you on Sunday. Bring everybody you know with you, your neighbors, your family, your friends, your enemies. Bring them all. God bless you. And if you'd like to give in the offering, Brother Larry has the offering plate. Thank you for giving.